Guten, guten Morgen. No, it's, don't worry, it's not going to be in German. <laughs> right, we have a lot to deal with today. Uh, it's my goal here, my role to set the scenes a little bit, uh, to establish some of the parameters, to lay out a whole range of issues. Um, and a lot of things are changing very rapidly, just as uh, Joachim mentioned, the systems themselves um, are changing. And uh, uh, Dr. Dietrich also mentioned that we've been talking about agriculture and nutrition for a, a very long time. But the nature of that dialogue has been changing quite rapidly. And it's gone even within the CG system very quickly from in the mid-90s, an assumption that making more calories available to the food system in itself results in improved nutrition and health to more recent recognition that actually that's not always the case. But the dialogue, the, the, the critique of, well, why might this be or why might this be in certain circumstances uh, has expanded and generated an amazing amount of intensity just in the last couple of years as we just heard. Now, I'm going to start with essentially my three main messages, starting with uh, what, what are the conclusions. And I think already we're here, we've heard from this first session, we need more honesty, which is, which, by which I mean clarity and transparency and specificity about what we can expect agriculture to achieve in health and nutrition. And that requires us to unpackage both agriculture and health and nutrition. They are not one thing, either on the agriculture side or the nutrition side. To do that, we need greater engagement across disciplines as well as sectors, especially around the, what are the appropriate standards of evidence across different sectors and across different disciplines, understanding each other's language metrics, and finding the way to be able together to convince policymakers and donors that doing investments in certain kinds of agriculture makes sense. That will require greater uh, engagement of the agriculture research community, the scientists, in the public health domain, in the public health dialogue in terms of agenda setting. Right now, we're clearly seeing many of these recent initiatives trying to bring communities together, but Still, most meetings are held in a sectoral and disciplinary fashion, and this isn't happening. And finally, I would argue that what we're talking about as the system itself changes is not just cha not really changing the research agenda within agriculture. A lot of the old, if you were the conventional research, is still required. It's going to be required forever. Um, but an expansion of that agenda. New areas may be necessary where, in fact, measurement, measurable impact on health and nutrition may be greater. And we will explain uh, what that kind of means. Now, we've heard since 2008, the Lancet series, the, the World Food Price Crisis, uh, the Sun Movement, a whole slew of an agendas have brought attention to the potential for agriculture to contribute to enhanced nutrition. All kinds of uh, large gatherings, lots of, of, of different meetings. And that has focused a lot of people's attention outside of agriculture on the potential for agriculture to reach unreached populations, unreached in the sense of often health services and nutrition, targeted nutrition interventions to enhance coverage and so on, uh, but at the same time to search evidence that it can actually deliver that. But those two things have really risen to the, agenda, to the top of, of the agenda. And the most recent iteration of the Lancet series on nutrition from this year, 2013, uh, explicitly brought those two concepts together. Targeted nutrition-specific actions, things that you do through, often in uh, health systems delivery, and nutrition-sensitive actions as a complement and a collaborative um, um, associated, associated set of interventions. Now, why, back, stepping back very quickly, the Lancet series, which is one of the premier, the Lancet, one of the premier journals in which health and nutrition research is published. 
um, this year reiterated the importance of nutrition. It's not, the problem is not going away, um, and we've heard that there are many manifestations of that problem, including uh, non-communicable diseases, overnutrition, and, and hidden hunger. But undernutrition is still, undernutrition is still responsible for almost 50% of preventable child deaths around the world in one form or another. Right? So that part has not changed fast enough or rapidly enough in key countries. You have children under five, 165 million stunted children still around the world, increasingly concentrated in a shrinking number of countries, yes, but you will still find stunting across the wealth quintiles of most countries around the world. And this problem has to be addressed because of its association with preventable child mortality. One of the new things that the new Lancet series pointed out was that a lot of this can be ascribed, 20% of the stunting by the age of three can be ascribed to um, in utero conditions. So the, the health and nutrition of the mother, potentially the adolescent girl pre-pregnancy, which means that there's an even greater impetus than there was before to address conditions of, of women as young, young women and then as pregnant mothers and then in the neonatal condition. So a lot of reiteration of the importance of this agenda, the fact that it remains huge and it's all around us. Now the Lancet also then in the nutrition specific interventions identified 10 what they call evidence-based interventions which if implemented at 90% coverage, so 90% of those in need in, in the 34 countries with the highest burden of stunting, if you achieved that, you could cut stunting by 20% and mortality by 15%. The problem being that this is very costly, mainly because coverage rates in the places where they're most needed are practically non-existent. So the cost is actually building up systems, making delivery systems available, facilities, outreach, and so on, and then maintaining, training, and delivering products. Right? So it's, there's a large cost associated with it, but the benefits, the returns, in terms of reduced stunting are even huger. Now, the big thing that was identified by Rajul is that a 20% reduction through targeted specific intervention still leaves 80% of the stunting problem unresolved. Do the math. That is a problem. So we have a set of evidence-based interventions. We know they work. We know that if we get them into the places where they are most needed, we can cut 20% of stunting and mortality. But that alone isn't going to do it. And that's what's driven attention to nutrition sensitive actions, not just agriculture, uh, programs in education, through safety nets, through various uh, welfare schemes, can also be nutrition sensitive. They can also support gains in uh, nutrition. And of course, what we're trying to do is, in fact, move the curve, the population curve. This just happens to be a curve for, for Nepal, for three different uh, agroecologies. But what most populations have is a curve around a zero point where half your population is somewhat undernourished, half your population is adequately uh, nourished, or at the, at the tails you have the extreme problems. The problem is a country like Nepal, for example, its curve is based at the minus two standard deviation point, which means by definition that roughly 50% of its population is on the undernourished side, on the stunted side. Its children are below minus two standard deviations. In fact, the actual figure is 46%. So if half of your children are stunted, that's a big problem. It's not, only, it's not going to be resolved just by achieving 90% coverage of those targeted interventions. They are essential. They are needed to be out there. Some of them are universal. Some of them need to be targeted to certain areas. But to shift this population curve to the right, not just for Nepal, but for all of the countries affected, is going to take a much greater effort, a much greater integration of specific and sensitive interventions. Now, the focus of a lot of attention uh, through these many meetings, the many papers, as I said, 
pushed people to start talking about the contribution of agriculture as one of these sensitive interventions and looking for evidence that it can. And uh, this one review by Masset and colleagues uh, in 2011, 2012, is just one of a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses that, that took a public health approach, a systematic review of, of the existing literature, the existing evidence, which has pretty high standards of acceptable evidence. All right? So it, it, by, by doing... Um, a review of the existing published literature, sometimes the gray literature across the, all kinds of data sets and, and across the internet, 7,000 studies that could potentially have been included in the analysis were identified, but only 23 of those 7,000 could in fact be included as having the methodological rigor, the counterfactuals that allowed with that particular approach, allowed them to be assessed in terms of evidence empirical evidence. And not surprisingly, um, th those studies that were included found investments in agriculture typically in, uh, resulted in improved farm output and productivity. You'd hope that. That's pretty standard. Um, there was, however, poor evidence on net income, lots of evidence of increased income in one particular area of the intervention, but net income, so what trade-offs were happening, was poorly assessed. Uh, very little assess, uh, assessment of whole diets, not just increasing the one commodity that was being promoted in the intervention, but what's happening in the whole diet was rarely assessed. And overall, the evidence of impact on nutrition was vanishingly small. Now, this one study, this isn't the only one, there have been 11 such studies trying to troll the literature in the past decade, and they all, every one of them, come up with the same results. But this one in particular, all of these actually, but this one in particular, is potentially quite damaging. Because what some people have taken these results to mean is either, well, obviously investment in agriculture doesn't achieve the results we want to in nutrition, and or we have no evidence of agriculture supporting nutrition. Neither of which is true. There are lots of programs, investments in agriculture that do support nutrition, and there is lots of evidence out there. But it's not necessarily treated in the same way that the public health domain and policymakers who link to the public health domain, the kinds of evidence they want to see. And in the last year, I've talked with policymakers in ministries of health, ministries of finance, in countries as diverse as Nepal, Uganda, Haiti, who've actually said, well, it's pretty clear, isn't it, that agriculture can't support nutrition, so let's forget about it. Let's just, they're not even on the table anymore. That's not part of the dialogue, right? Now, that is not where we need to be, right? We do have a lot of evidence, right? We know that investments in agriculture productivity of different kinds um, achieves improved food availability, increases uh, income, increases stability of prices and price transmission. Um, we have lots of evidence of that. We also have a fair amount of evidence that uh, where you focus on areas where women, women's crops or women's control or empowerment of women through agriculture can be achieved, um, then you can improve uh, the nutrition of children as well. Now, I'm explicitly avoiding the P word here, the pathways. I'm just using mechanisms here. Um, so we have evidence of these, these kinds of mechanisms. And we know from national level, multi-year data, for example, multi-country data, that per capita income derived through agriculture can reduce, is associated with a, a reduction of stunting of 15 to 20%. So right there, just the, the same old stuff, just conventional investments in productivity, raising yields, raising income through agriculture, we've already, we can already achieve another 20% another reduction in um, stunting, potentially. But there are also, at the programmatic level, there are mechanisms that we know, and I, I take one example from Professor von Braun here, of introduction of new technology in West Africa, 
uh, note measurably improving productivity, household incomes, and having labor um, substitution effects, that both positive and negative. The higher productivity was essentially a three-fold, in this case, an irrigation package with improved seeds and fertilizers and so on. Three-fold returns to, um, uh, to labor a net increase in real incomes at the household level of 13% as a result of this particular intervention. A 10% increase in income at the household level was associated with almost a 5% increase in the calorie availability in, that, in those households. All of, all of this you'd expect. Uh, a 10% increase in the calorie availability resulted in a roughly 2.4, 2.5% uh, reduction in child um, underweight. These are mechanisms that we have evidence of from many, many different countries, not necessarily published in the same literature, published in the same way, with the same kinds of methods as others. But the conclusion, even of these studies, was that child nutrition, uh, associated with the introduction of this new technology, uh, improved, but perhaps not as much as you'd expect. And that's where a lot of the what do we need to know resides. We know a lot of the mechanisms that actually increase productivity, income, and food. We often don't know in given settings, why isn't it translating quite as much as we'd expect in terms of nutrition outcomes? There are other mechanisms involved. Diet quality, not just improving nutrient density of individual commodities, not just improving individual cultivars themselves, but the diet as a whole. And there's issues there in terms of re reducing anti-nutrients within the diet, changing dietary choices, di changing dietary patterns in ways that enhance, as opposed to impede, nutrient bioavailability or the impact on health and nutrition. There's also food system safety or agricultural hygiene, you might want to call it. There are a lot of potential pathogens, environmental impacts through agriculture, from pesticides, from animals themselves, many different kinds uh, that can increasingly, we suspect, directly, not indirectly, directly impede nutritional status, including stunting. And then there are platforms. A lot of programs, agricultural pr platforms, provide the potential for integration with other sectors, a mechanism whereby a complementary resources, services, information, uh, resources could potentially be uh, delivered in tandem with um, agriculture. And these, it could be argued, and I'm going to argue, that a lot of conventional ag research linking to nutrition has been in the domain of productivity enhancement and gender empowerment a little bit on diet quality, um, a little bit in the other domains. It could be argued that the future where specific new research in agriculture linkages to nutrition and health is actually in a slightly different domain, a slightly different lens. That's not downplaying the first, that has to happen. But we may need to, we may need to look more at other areas, kind of do no harm lens, to actually understand where the problems reside. Problems do reside, they continue, not just in that Masset, because the Lancet series, the third paper itself, had a, it, there is a third paper in the series on agriculture, on, on, as well as uh, other nutrition-sensitive interventions, and they concluded that the evidence of effectiveness, they mean targeted agricultural programs, by and large, except with the exception of vitamin A, is limited. So there is this very strong sense among the public health community that what we have today is inconclusive evidence of agriculture's link to nutrition. We need to change this. We collectively need to change this. Partly, uh, the argument was that uh, there are weaknesses in programs. A lot of programs proclaim too much. They say we will result in improved health and nutrition of the beneficiaries. And there is no plausible mechanism by which they actually could do that. Right? So really, that's the honesty part, the specificity part. But there's also weaknesses, what they call, the Lancet calls weaknesses, in the study design. And we can talk a great deal more about that, and we probably should. Now, Masset talks about 
a conventional um, a linear approach to an intervention where you have technology adoption resulting in improved household income and diet composition and so on, leading to nutritional status, uh, the, one of the conventional pathways. The problem is that a lot of the agriculture and livelihoods literature really only deals with the first part of that chain, and a lot of the nutrition health literature really only deals with the other side. And there's very few uh, re large-scale replicated research initiatives that combine the two, that bridge those. And yet, this is where understanding of why technology adoption of, or of, any, of many different kinds may not result in anticipated nutritional status. There are many things that can happen across that dividing line, and they happen from uh, promotion with irrigation of, of malaria or pesticide use. There's obviously uh, who controls the income, the added income and resources within the household. There's lots of trade-offs, potential trade-offs in, in terms of opportunity cost of time and entry barriers to, to adoption. Um, diet quality, actually you can improve one nutrient in a, in a diet and it has no effect because other nutrients or other anti-nutrients are getting in the way and cancelling it out. There's the non not just the aflatoxins that were mentioned, there's many mycotoxins and other cytokines that can actually be impeding health and nutrition directly. And now increasing attention to the gut microbiota, the shared pathogens between animals and humans that keep those animals. And all of these can directly impede micronutrient status as well as potentially linear growth. And so we're stuck at the point right now Hopefully this is the beginning of changing this agenda. At a, we're at a point where the potential is clear, but there is a, a strong perception that the, that potential has yet to be unleashed. And so what do we need to know to unleash it? Well, the Lancet series actually had something like 60 plus priority research questions. I'm not going to go through those. Picked out a few of, of those that relate specifically to the nutrition sensitive agenda. Uh, one of them was cost effectiveness. When and how and why does it make sense to invest in this kind, of, this kind of intervention in agriculture versus any other kind of inter intervention in agriculture or an intervention outside of agriculture given the same outcome that you're trying to achieve? Understanding intermediate outcomes, so those v various blockage points, choke points along that linear chain that I was mentioning, what are the things? How, why, we cannot anymore afford to assume that we've got the logic down, but we don't really know why, what is a plausible reason why the nutrition outcome isn't what we wanted to see it. Entry barriers, um, when is it making more sense to integrate interventions across sectors versus simply locate them in the same places, co-location? Uh, and have, make sure that um, ministries are working together versus side by side. And then scalability. Agriculture, one of the greatest potential benefits of agriculture is scale, one of the holy grails of the public health domain. So what can we do to document scalability? Um, El Syro, we heard from earlier, um, an assessment, a gap analysis of current and planned research linking agriculture and nutrition for DFID that was published last year. 151 current or planned research activities were reviewed. So there's a lot of evidence in the pipeline. The problem, one of the problems, is that of those 151 studies, barely 40 actually measured nutrition outcomes as part of their agenda. Their research agenda, trying to document agriculture to nutrition, uh, m less than half are actually measuring all the way along the chain. Uh, very few are focusing on the poorest households within any particular um, population subset. And um, very, very few, six I think out of the 151, are even looking at the diets of children under two, which is the thousand day agenda, the focus of, of, new, of stunting. So some of the, the core um, priorities, let's link, let's complete those links, at least in a few measurable, convincing ways to document. Cost effectiveness comes up again. What is most cost effective to achieve the, the results in nutrition that we want to achieve 
either through alternative investments in agriculture or beyond. A focus on subgroups, not just assuming that all, all farmers are the same, of course they're not. Um, the pathogen issue, the, the food hygiene value chains comes up, policy effects comes up, and what are the government's incentives for effective nutrition sensitive policies? What, are we, what do we need to demonstrate to get governments to accept that this is the truth? Finally, um, a group of donors, uh, the, the learning framework, their own, from this year, their own assessment of what is needed, what are priority research areas in agriculture and nutrition, and you're seeing the same things coming up again. Cost effectiveness. How do we know that this is more cost effective than that? Mediators by context, which is just another way of, of saying what are the choke points, what are the blockages along the same. What combinations of sector actions, again, integration versus co-location, what makes sense to combine, value chains, actual mechanisms, understanding the mechanisms, and effective governments. So a lot of possible here, things here for us to discuss, a lot of domains that these groups have identified as priority areas for research to get non-agricultural policymakers and donors on board with this agenda and move beyond the mantra that has become, well, we actually don't have any evidence that agriculture supports nutrition, so eh, maybe we should just wait and not, not make the investments that are necessary. This is important, uh, and I'm coming to the end. <laughs> this is the... Uh, the, the, the strategic level objectives, the, the four that were mentioned by Ken across the top, and we, we have health and nutrition yep, um, at, at the top, and there are lots of elements that are currently being researched that touch on the things that I've been talking about. Uh, food food uh, affordability and, and price stability and increased consumption of um, income for the poorest, uh, empowerment of women, um, aflatoxin, uh, contamination and so on. So there, there are elements across this, across the entire system, that touch on different places, uh, different pieces of the puzzle. And one of the issues here is going to be how do we get it all connected? How do we connect the dots? How do we make it a coherent whole so that there is a convincing narrative behind this particular agenda? And it, I would argue it shouldn't be just for A4 and H, just for one piece of the CG system, if all parts of the CG system are claiming that they have some contribution to health and nutrition, then we need to go beyond claiming. And that's not necessarily uh, straightforward. That means looking sometimes at the arrows between boxes, not just at the boxes themselves. We need to understand mechanisms. We need to understand the choke points. For example, are we convinced that by introducing one particular commodity that we're increasing consumption of that particular nutrient-rich commodity and not displacing something else, for example? And are we really convinced that that increases consumption uh, of a nutritious diet, not just a nutritious food? Which, And are we convinced that that in itself really is the main uh, entry point to enhance nutrition and health for the consumers that we're talking about. Not everything has to be measured, not everything has to be documented everywhere, but I think we can do better than we have been. So final points, I think not just we could do better, we have to do better. We are, we are stewards of scarce resources, donors, governments themselves, are really interested, really keen on this agenda, but they, need, they remain to be convinced. And we have to show them in ways that they understand. We have to be able to demonstrate what is cost effective and explain why this makes sense for them to invest. That means more high quality research. You'll all be glad to hear about that. We need more, not, not less. We need more we need the agronomy, we need the ag econ uh, understanding of market development, we need the, the environment and resource management, we need all of that. But in addition to that, we have a, an expanded responsibility, an expanded uh, research agenda that passes the bar of evidence, critical evidence that can be convincing. Now, we have to agree what that bar represents. And it, as, just as Per Pinster Panderson, in a commentary to the Lancet series, eloquently stated, it's not easy to randomize and to control agricultural interventions, especially uh, policy interventions across whole countries.
but we need to talk the language, we need to be able to meet the public health and, and economics um, domains to be convincing. We need to claim less and demonstrate more to be able to uh, convince, and that means net impacts, not just gross changes in systems. And there's a lot more we need to understand. Dose re by dose response, I mean how much of an additional input in agriculture do we, can we expect to achieve uh, a certain outcome? What are contextual effect modifiers? How do we work across disciplines, across sectors, in ways that make sense for cash-strapped governments? All of these things are critical right now. They're urgent. They're time-sensitive. We will be getting a lot more evidence coming in the next couple of years from this 150-plus um, studies. But now is the time to be working collectively to come up with next generation, highly rigorous cross-disciplinary research agendas that nail this once and for all. Thank you. <laughs>